Lecture 4.1 Wave Properties of Particles In Chapter 3, we saw that light sometimes acts like a particle, which we now call a photon. Albert Einstein won the Nobel Prize for this discovery when he showed that the photoelectric effect can only be understood with a particle model of light. In Chapter 4, we will show that the opposite is also true that particles such as electrons, protons, and even whole atoms sometimes act like waves. The waves will be called de Broglie waves, and the functions that describe those waves are called the wave function for the particle. In 1924, the French physicist de Broglie suggested that since waves can be particles, perhaps particles can also be waves. De Broglie knew that the momentum of a massless particle is given by uh, P equals Planck's constant H over the wavelength lambda. He suggested that the same relation might be used to calculate the wavelength of a massive particle such as an electron. He won the Nobel Prize for this discovery in 1929. This wavelength, now called the de Broglie wavelength, is simply Planck's constant divided by the particle's momentum p. Notice that the larger the momentum the particle has, the shorter its de Broglie wavelength. We might imagine the electron represented by a little wave packet, where the wavelength is approximately the distance between successive crests of the wave. De Broglie did this work as a graduate student at the University of Paris. His PhD dissertation is quite readable and is posted on Blackboard. He won the Nobel Prize uh, for his work in 1929. Let's look at an example and calculate the de Broglie wavelength of an ant. Suppose the ant is about 0.1 grams and walks along at about 1 centimeter per second. The Ant's de Broglie wavelength is lambda is Planck's constant over the momentum, plugging in values of h and mass and velocity gives a de Broglie wavelength of about 6.626 times 10 to the negative 28 meters. For comparison, a Fermi is about 10 to the negative 15th meters. Well, it's exactly 10 to the negative 15th meters, and is the approximate size of an atomic nucleus. So if we convert our results into Fermis, we see that the de Broglie wavelength of the ant is less than one trillionth of the diameter of an atomic nucleus. So uh, the de Broglie wavelength of almost any macroscopic object you can imagine is going to be far too small to actually measure experimentally. That doesn't mean that the ant doesn't have a wave-like nature, it just means it's too small for us to measure. Let's now calculate the de Broglie wavelength of an electron confined in a hydrogen atom. To a rough approximation, the kinetic energy of an electron inside an atom is on the order of a few electron volts. We'll cover this in a couple of chapters. Let's assume that the kinetic energy is one electron volt and the mass is uh, 0.511 MeV per C squared. We'll first find the momentum and then use the momentum to calculate the de Broglie wavelength. Since the electron's kinetic energy is much less than its rest energy, we can safely use the Newtonian expression for kinetic energy of 1 half mv squared, or kinetic energy is the momentum squared over 2m. Multiplying top and bottom by c squared, we can now conveniently substitute in uh, the values up above. So solving for PC, we find that it's equal to the square root of 2 times the rest energy times the kinetic energy, which is about 1 keV, or 1,000 electron volts. 
we can now write the expression for the de Broglie wavelength uh, in a more convenient form by again multiplying top and bottom by C so that the wavelength is HC over PC. We have the expression for PC and remembering that HC is 1240 electron volts times nanometers, that was in the previous chapter, we can find that the de Broglie wavelength is about 1.23 nanometers, which is on the order of magnitude about the size of an atom. In fact, in a few chapters, we're going to see that de Broglie waves are really just electron orbitals that we're used to in uh, physics and chemistry. So unlike the de Broglie wave for an ant, which is way too small to be measured, the de Broglie wave for electrons in atoms are, uh, have been directly observed and confirmed. The simplest type of de Broglie wave is an infinite sinusoidal traveling wave. We define the wave through a wave function using the Greek letter psi. So as we see, psi will depend on both the space x and time t. The constants k and omega in the sine function are the wave number and the angular frequency of the wave. So the wave number, <clears throat> you might remember from introductory physics, is 2 pi over the wavelength, <clears throat> and it has units of radians per meter. The angular frequency, omega, is 2 pi times the standard frequency, f. The angular frequency has units of radians per second, and the frequency has units of 1 over seconds or hertz. <coughs> Thus, the wave number k, <coughs> excuse me, Thus, the wave number k is telling us something about the spatial behavior of the wave, and the angular frequency omega is telling us something about how the wave behaves in time. Because of all the two pi's flying around on the last slide, it is convenient to introduce a new constant h bar. h bar is simply Planck's constant divided by two pi, and its value is roughly 1.055 times 10 to the negative 34th joule seconds. h bar comes in handy, for example, if we want to write the momentum of our de Broglie wave in terms of the wave number k. So we'll start with the expression for the uh, de Broglie uh, wavelength and momentum relationship. So the momentum is Planck's constant over lambda. We'll multiply top and bottom by 2 pi and realize that the first term is just h bar and the second term is the wave number k. Thus we see that the momentum of a de Broglie wave is, is h bar times the wave number k as the wave number gets higher and higher, we see that the momentum uh, also gets higher. We've seen that the wavelength or the wave number of the de Broglie wave tells us the wave's momentum. But what about the angular frequency omega of the wave? What does it tell us? For traveling waves, we know that the frequency times the wavelength is the speed of the wave, and more technically, it's the phase velocity of the wave, which we'll define a little bit later on. Unfortunately, we don't know what the speed of a de Broglie wave is for a particle, so we can't really use this expression. Instead, we will um, use the expression for massless photon. So even though we're applying this to a massive particle like an electron, we're going to use the expression that we derived earlier for massless protons like a massless particles like a photon. <clears throat> 
So we know that for massless particles, the energy is Planck's constant times the frequency. And again, we're just going to apply this now to our electron, even though the electron has mass. We can rewrite this expression in terms of the angular frequency omega by making appropriate substitutions. So again, we can use the trick before, multiply and divide both terms by 2 pi. The first term is h bar and the second term is just omega. So we see that the energy of a de Broglie wave can be written as either Planck's constant h times f or h bar times omega. There are two equivalent ways of writing it. We haven't proved these results or derived them from fundamental principles. We've just made some assumptions. That's what de Broglie did, and he won the Nobel Prize for it. So let's organize our results in, in a table. So the columns of the table will be expressions that contain h and h bar, and the rows will be expressions for the momentum and energy. So as, we as we've shown, the momentum can be written as either h over lambda or as h bar times k. That's the momentum of our de Broglie wave. The energy of a de Broglie wave can be written as either h times f, that's Planck's constant times the frequency, or h bar times omega. As we will see in the next chapter, all physical properties defined for a particle will be seen to be encoded in properties of the wave function. So in this case, we've seen that the momentum of the particle shows up as the wavelength of the de Broglie <coughs> wave function, and the energy shows up as the frequency of it. So what's the evidence that particles actually do exhibit wave behavior? Just as x-rays produce diffraction patterns when they are shot through a crystals, electrons can also be diffracted by crystals if the de Broglie wavelength of the electron is comparable to the spacing of the atoms in the crystal lattice. The image on the left-hand side shows a diffraction pattern of electrons through the crystal. The center image shows an electron microscope image of uh, pollen grains. In electron microscope, electrons uh, are basically uh, treated as waves, and uh, so you're using the electron waves to do the imaging like you would use light waves to do imaging in a regular microscope. And the right-hand side is an illustration of uh, electron orbitals in atoms. So uh, some electron orbitals actually have been directly imaged um, using uh, advanced techniques. Uh, but, uh, but again, electron orbitals uh, have been well established experimentally, and so they al are also evidence of uh, de Broglie wave or wave nature of electrons. So uh, in the last chapter, we saw that Young's famous double slit experiment demonstrated that light is a wave. It turns out that the double slit experiment can also be performed using electrons to show that electrons are also waves. The diagram on the left shows an electron gun shooting electrons through two narrowly spaced slits. A fluorescent screen is placed behind the slits so that when the electron hits it, a flash of light will be emitted. The flash is then recorded by a piece of photographic film directly behind it. <clears throat> if the electrons really act like particles, we might expect the screen to show two columns of electrons. The electrons in the left column would have passed through the left slit, and the electrons in the right column would have passed through the right slit. So Hitachi or Hitachi performed this experiment in 
So Hitachi performed this experiment in 1989. Here's a video showing the results of their actual experiment. Electrons pass through the slits one at a time and show up as flashes of light on the screen. You can see the tiny dots that are appearing correspond to individual electrons reaching the screen. At first, the electrons seem to appear at random across the screen. But as the, experiments run, but as the experiment runs, and more and more electrons are observed, an interference pattern slowly comes into view. You see alternating patterns of dense and sparse columns. These alternating patterns of high density electron, height of, of places where lo there's lots of electrons and then other places where there's few electrons is clear evidence that the electrons are acting like waves as they pass through the two slits. On the other hand, when we actually observe the electrons on the screen, they're acting like particles because the electrons are showing up as dots or point-like objects on the screen. So the electrons seem to have a dual nature. When they're going through the slits, they seem to act like a wave. When they show up on the screen, they seem to be acting like particles. So, in summary, how do we interpret the results of the double slit experiment with electrons? So, electrons are detected on the screen as particles. So that means that they're showing up as points on the screen. But the pattern of dots exhibits interference fringes, which is evidence of interacting waves. The interference fringes show up even though only one electron goes through the slit at a time. So the question becomes, how can an electron interfere with itself? Does it split in half in order to pass through both slits so that then it can exhibit interference pattern? Well, the answer is no. It somehow passes through the slits as a wave rather than as a particle. This is sometimes called wave-particle duality or the principle of complementarity. Electrons act like waves when you're quote-unquote not looking, and they act like particles when you are looking. So they act like waves when they're passing through the slits and you're not watching them, but then they act like particles when you do watch them on the screen. If you watch the electron pass through a given slit, so if you put um, some detector right near one of the slits so that you can measure the electron when it goes through one slit or another, then the interference pattern disappears. Let's say that again. If you can tell which slit the electron goes through, then you're forcing it to act like a particle the whole time and the wave nature of the electron disappears and it just acts like a particle. You don't see the interference pattern on the screen. But if you don't watch the slit, then the electron wants to behave like a wave. It passes through both slits somehow, interferes with itself, and the interference pattern on the screen reemerges. So what are they waves of? Well, the physicist Max Born suggested that de Broglie waves are mathematical objects that let one calculate the probability of where the particle will be found. So in some sense, one could say they are waves of probability. The Copenhagen interpretation of the wave function says that particles do not have definite properties prior to being measured. Rather, they are in a superposition of many possible states. When one makes a measurement, the wave function collapses and the particle makes up its mind about what its uh, properties are. We will discuss this in more detail later in the semester. And a final note, we should note that it's not just electrons that exhibit this wave-particle duality. Neutrons have been, ex has been demonstrated to exhibit wave-like nature. This uh, image shows the interference patterns of uh, neutrons uh, going through a double slit experiment. Um, 
helium atoms, so entire atoms also exhibit a wave-like nature when they are not observed. And, and the largest object known to date is uh, the Buckminster fullerene molecule, or C60. So, and so a molecule containing 60 atoms has, uh, has demonstrated this wave-like phenomenon in some experiments. One, of course, could extrapolate this to macroscopic objects and ask what it would mean for a macroscopic object such as people to exhibit a wave-like nature. All right, up next, properties of wave functions.